Thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church, Friendship Ministries YouTube channel. Today we're in Psalm 1. The title of the sermon is Spiritual Versus Unspiritual. And before we get into our message, I, I want to open with a word of prayer. Then I'm going to close the message with a word of prayer. And after that prayer, I'm going to invite you to join us for the Lord's Supper, where we'll take the emblem of the bread and the cup. I strongly encourage you to participate with us in that Lord's Supper. So get you something to eat, something to drink, and plan on joining us. Now, you don't have to have unleavened bread. You don't have to have fruit of the vine. Okay, God will take care of that. Just, just get you something so that you can participate. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, we just pray that as you search our hearts and our minds, that you meet all those needs that are listed there. And Father, we pray for our personal prayer list, that you give peace, comfort, and healing to where it's needed. And Father, we just pray that you allow Friendship Christian Church to shine with the light of the truth of Jesus Christ in Frankfort, Kentucky. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm 1. Now, spiritual versus unspiritual. Happy Father's Day, by the way, to all the fathers out there. And in this context, there are two types of fathers, which also applies to Christians at large, to all humans. And that is the spiritual versus the unspiritual. The psalm is a comparison of the two, of the two. The psalm begins with the word blessed. Blessed, which is understood to mean happy. Generally speaking, this definition is true, uh, a true precept if you put it in the context of happy. But uh, the psalmist is not talking about our feelings or emotions, which we equate to our feeling of happiness, but rather to the fullness of our lives. Rather to the fullness of our lives. The, uh, the having uh, peace, contentment, and satisfaction in life, deep in our souls, that's the definition of what happy should be. That is the definition of being blessed. We're blessed to be happy because not a super, superficial emotion, but deep down inside of us, we have peace. We have inner peace. We have contentment in all situations. We have satisfaction in our lives that we are serving Jesus, that we are serving Jesus. So it's a, it's a fullness. It's not, an, it's not a uh, temporary emotion that comes and goes. It's a fullness of life, of life. So therefore, he begins with that word. So what the blessed one does not do. What the blessed one does does not do. That's what we'll see in Psalm 1. Let's, let's move on. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Notice, walk, stand, sit. The psalmist is describing what the blessed person does not do, does not walk in step with the wicked, does not stand in the way that the sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. So walk in step with the wicked. Walk in step with the wicked. We sometimes commit the error of looking to ungodly people for guidance and advice. And we look at them because 
They look like they have it all together. Or they have all the credentials. Or they're prosperous. Now let's, let's get some of their advice. But do not, do not seek that advice from those who are ungodly. Do not seek it from those who do not follow God. They have a different set of values. They have different goals. They have a different world view. And why should we want to follow their advice, which leaves God out of it? They, they're standards. Do we want ungodly standards? So blessed are those who do not heed the advice of the ungodly. And blessed does not stand in the way that sinners take. There is a path. There is a path that sinners are walking down. And Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Don't, don't walk the path. Don't walk the path of the wicked, of the sinners. The one who's blessed by God will not find themselves standing on the path that's, that sinners are on, that leads to destruction. Once we're standing on that road, we need to quickly get ourselves off that road and turn around before it's too late. And finally, the one who's blessed does not sit in the company of mockers. To sit with them suggests that you are one of them, that you validate what they're doing. You have fellowship with the mockers and have taken your seat with them if you sit in the company of mockers. Uh, clearly, those who are mockers of God will not be blessed by God. Do not validate their mocking. Do not participate in the things they participate in. Do not stay silent as if it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. Godly people should not engage in any of that. In any of that. Now, what does the blessed do? Well, that brings us to verse 2. What the blessed one does but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. After describing what the blessed one does not do, the psalmist describes for us what the one who is blessed by God is doing. First, the writer tells us that the one who is blessed has delight in the law of the Lord. The blessed takes pleasure in the laws of the Lord. Follow the Ten Commandments. Follow the Ten Commandments. And Jesus gave us two, two ways that everything falls into place. Love your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Do that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do that. And all the laws of God fall into place. You're living a godly life, a blessed life. You delight in the law of the Lord. Now, this may be rather unusual statement as a glance, but that's how you delight in it. You take pleasure in serving Jesus by loving your God and loving your neighbor. You live a life that, that God has commanded that was given and 
that can maximize our spiritual living. Second, the psalmist tells us in uh, the rest of this verse 2 how we can delight in the law of the Lord. He says, meditate on his law day and night. That doesn't mean you don't do anything else. Okay? But you can meditate sometime during the day and sometime during the night. Meditate on his law day and night. The scripture are on your mind during the day. Scripture and trying to please Jesus should be on your mind at night. Scripture and doing right by Jesus should be on your mind. So what you can do then is have a focused mind on Christian living. Be focused on living for Jesus in every aspect of your life, everything you do through the day and night. So we should delight and take pleasure in seeking to serve Jesus in all of our capacities, day and night. And then the end result, verse 3, the end result. Uh, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in seasons and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now, this is not wealth theology, okay? This is not wealth geology, uh, theology. But this is a common illustration that's used in the Old Testament to describe spiritual strength that we will receive from the Lord, you know, uh, it, we're like a tree that's planted by the streams of the waters. We get nourishment. Uh, look at, uh, uh, I, I wanted to share Jeremiah verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 7 with you. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water and sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never falls, fails, never fails to bear fruit. So in the New Testament, water is the Holy Spirit, the living water, which will not dry up, but will continue to give the needed nutrition for sustenance. John, John chapter 7, verse 37. We have Jesus talking. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, it's scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So here we have Old Testament, New Testament validating the tree that's watered. It's by the stream. The tree is firmly planted by God. We are anchored down <clears throat> and cannot be moved. Further, the blessed one is a fruitful person to the Lord. To bear fruit is to be a person that's useful to the kingdom of God. First, the natural product of a healthy plant. That's what fruit is, a healthy product of a healthy plant. In the same way, fruit is also a natural product of a healthy Christian. 
If we are not bearing fruit, then there is a very good chance that we have not been planted and blessed by God. For to bear fruit, you must live for Christ. To live for Christ, you must share the gospel. You must share the gospel. And sometimes that gospel may go places. Somebody may receive it. Maybe one person receives it. Maybe 30. Maybe 60. Uh, Matt, uh, Mark chapter 4 verse 20. Others, like seed thrown or good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 uh, times what was sown. So if you're a healthy tree and you're getting watered, if you're a healthy Christian and you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to you're going to share the gospel. That's how you're serving the kingdom of God. And sometimes that that little seed you plant may take root. Whatever they do prospers. Whatever they do prospers. Those who are properly respect God's word, will enjoy spiritual prosperity and spiritual success. Spiritual prosperity. To prosper is to receive the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Holy Spirit. Well, what are they? What kind of fruit does the Holy Spirit give? And how can I benefit from that? How do I prosper in that? Well, here it is. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 lays it out for us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You see, if you're, if you're taking in the Holy Spirit and you're a healthy Christian, you're going to receive these fruits and you're going to receive them in abundance. That's how you're going to prosper. You prosper in these fruits. And it trickles in little by little by little and you continue to grow and grow and grow and prosper and prosper. And you're going to be able to use those fruits to bear fruit as a good Christian, because you can pass all of this on. All of this on. And the immediate results of the wicked in verse 4. Not so the wicked. They are like the shaft that the wind blows away. All of these great things that we have described that the blessed have hope in from verse 3 are not true for the wicked. The wicked are not planted by streams of water. They're not fruitful. They do wither. They do not prosper. When trouble comes, the wicked do not understand, are not anchored down, and therefore do not endure. They're not firmly rooted, and they simply blow away. They're driven by the winds of culture and society. Whichever it blows, it does not follow God. They do not have the fruits of the Spirit, and they follow an unbelieving world to destruction. <coughs> final, final results of the, the wicked. Verse 5, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. They're not going to be able to present any righteousness to God when they come to judgment. You see, we have righteousness in the blood of Jesus. Not our own. We, we have no righteousness. We have the righteousness of the blood of Jesus. That lets us forego, <coughs> excuse me, that lets us forego this judgment. They don't have any righteousness to present. Without Jesus' blood, there is no righteousness. So they're not going to be able to stand at all before the fury and wrath and judgment of God. 
And final reminders. Final reminders, verse 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The Lord is watching our path, the path that we're on. The psalmist says that God knows our ways. It is an intimate relationship with the righteous that the righteous have with the Lord because of the blood of Christ, because we are not righteous. But Jesus counts us as righteous in our relationship with him through his blood, through his blood. The wicked do not have this. They don't have an intimate relationship with the Lord. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. They're on their own path. They're not on the Jesus path. They're walking alone. They're, they're making their own way. And they cannot, they cannot avoid the pits of destruction, which ultimately will lead them to the lake of fire. So, what about you? What about you? Why don't we become part of the blessed? Why don't we become part of the blessed? Surrender to God daily. Let's do that. Let's surrender to God daily. Every day when we arise, make the choice. Make the choice. First chance you get out of bed, make the choice to serve God that day, to have a relationship with Jesus that day. And do what God wants you to do. Spend time with God daily. Spend time talking to Him, reading His Word, thinking about the goodness of God and, and how He loves you. And then separate from the ungodly daily. Do not heed the advice of the ungodly, of the wicked. Do not stand on their pathway. Do not sit with those who mock your religion, who mock God. Jesus showed us the way. Jesus has shown us how to enter through the narrow gate. Choose who you will serve today. Choose to follow Jesus that leads to eternal life. Surrender to God. Spend time with God. Separate from the ungodly. Ask Him to give you the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to give you forgiveness. Ask Him to give you salvation. Ask Him to give you the way, the narrow gate to stand on. If you need help with that, you can call me. 502-220-1285. More than happy to help you. Uh, answer any questions. Now I'd like to close with a word of prayer. But then I strongly encourage you, strongly encourage you, to stay with us and participate in the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Father, we just pray that you give us the will, the strength, and the faith to always be standing on your path, to always be seeking a way to serve you throughout our day and night. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now get you something to eat, something to drink. It doesn't have to, doesn't have to be unleavened bread, doesn't have to be fruit of the vine. I have me some bread here, and Jesus broke bread and said, Take ye, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, he said to those in the upper room. And 
That's exactly what he did on the cross. On his body, he took all the punishment. On his body, he took on all the sins of the world. His body became sin. And then it died. And we're free. We're free of sin. We're forgiven. We're free to serve him. Let us pray. Father, we just pray that you take this element, that you transconfigure it to be the substance it should be as Jesus' body, the innocent, the purely innocent, given for the purely guilty. Father, we ask your blessings on this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. And then he took a cup and he passed it to everyone. And he said, take, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. We have a contract. We have a contract with Jesus. He gave all of his blood. And it's the blood that allows us to appear righteous. To appear righteous before God. Because it's his righteousness that, that God will see. That's what the blood does for us. It gives us eternal life into heaven. Because only the righteous can be there. Let us pray. Father, we just pray that you take the contents of this cup. Transconfigure it to be the substance it should be. For with this cup, with Jesus' blood, we can follow Jesus. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. And by his blood, we're resurrected into the kingdom of heaven. Father, we ask your blessings on this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, and may we all go in peace.